news, everyone, and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. And I'm Maureen Ellsbury. Thanks for joining us today. We'll be joined later on the show by Dr. Seth Shostak from the SETI Institute to talk about astrobiology and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But first, we'll get you caught up on some of the news stories that have made headlines recently. Astrobiologists typically target Earth-like planets in the search for extraterrestrial life. But one scientist is encouraging a broader search. MIT astrophysicist Sarah Seeger believes the narrow search by researchers will bypass many potentially habitable worlds. Space.com explains Seeger's point that, while it may seem natural to zero in on alien Earth, such a narrow focus would exclude many potentially life-supporting exoplanets whose diversity continues to astound astronomers. Most of the current efforts looking for alien life seek out Earth-like planets because those worlds are more likely to support life as we know it. But as Seeger explained to Space.com, the number of planets that we're going to be able to see in our lifetime and look at their atmospheres for signs of life is so small that we're forced to be open-minded. Seeger believes that a more open-minded approach paired with a better understanding of exoplanet habitability is essential to the search for extraterrestrial life. Studying atmospheres of potentially habitable worlds is crucial in the effort to gain a better understanding of exoplanets. And fortunately, NASA is launching a new tool designed to do just that. The James Webb Space Telescope is launching in 2018, and it will be able to analyze the atmospheres of exoplanets and search for signs of life. Seeger's ideas about exoplanet habitability were just published in an article in a special exoplanet issue of the journal Science. And her hope is that this article gets people to realize that so many types of worlds could be habitable and that our chance of finding one is higher when we accept that. An international group of scientists, government officials, and military personnel has been assembled to speak about the scientific investigation of unidentified aerial phenomena. On June 29th through the 30th, more than 10 researchers from around the world will convene for the 2013 Symposium on Official and Scientific Investigations of Unidentified Aerial Phenomena at the Greensboro War Memorial Auditorium in Greensboro, North Carolina. The event's host and organizer, Kent Center, has researched UFOs for nearly 30 years and is one of the founding members of the Mutual UFO Network's North Carolina chapter. The event's website explains that Center is battling an incurable cancer. So he has decided to host this unique conference to help increase awareness of the need for scientific research and alleviate the taboo associated with the topic. As the News and Record points out, the lineup of speakers includes high-level officials, a former NASA senior scientist, a retired Belgian major general, an Iranian Air Force fighter pilot. For the full list of speakers and for all the event's details, visit cufornc.com. On Tuesday, April 30th, we published a story on OpenMinds.tv about a passenger plane that nearly collided with a UFO over Glasgow, Scotland suburb in December 2012. The pilots reported narrowly missing an unidentified object that was bigger than a balloon and was blue and yellow or silver in color with a small frontal area. The incident was thoroughly investigated by the UK Air Prox Board, but the group was unable to identify the UFO. But according to Scotland's Daily Record, a plausible identification recently surfaced. The Daily Record published a story on Wednesday, May 1st about the near-collision incident, and after reading the story, local resident James Orman contacted the Daily Record to report that his son Billy lost his grip on his six-foot-long, helium-filled, remote-controlled shark toy at about the same time the incident with the plane occurred. He explains, The report said the object was blue and yellow and silvery. I thought, oh, nah, because that was the color of Billy's remote-controlled shark, and it went missing around about the time of the incident. The helium-filled remote-controlled shark toy was also suggested as the likely identification for a UFO captured on video by a 12-year-old girl in Ohio back in March 2012. And although no official identification has been made regarding the aerial object in Scotland, Billy's shark toy is a plausible explanation that fits the description provided by the plane's pilots. A data company that launched in 2012 is helping the SETI Institute search for extraterrestrials. According to Business Insider Australia, San Jose, California-based Skytree has quietly amassed the biggest, brightest minds in the computer science machine learning industry. In a relatively short period of time, the company has attracted top talent. And the company's co-founder and chief technology officer, Georgia Tech scientist Alexander Gray, reportedly won an award for his work on proving the existence of dark matter. These industry leaders are drawn to the company because Skytree is pioneering machine learning data analysis. This process uses algorithms to sift through massive volumes of data to find the answers to questions you didn't even know you had. Reviewing massive volumes of data has been challenging for the SETI Institute. This organization has a constant stream of incoming data from radio telescope arrays searching for signals from intelligent extraterrestrials. And until now, only a small percentage of that data could be reviewed. But by utilizing SkyTree servers, the data can now be analyzed as it's received. 
this is really cool technology, and it, I don't know, to me it sounds a little like Terminator, Skynet, Skytree, okay. he's learning computers. But it's a huge step forward for, for SETI, because I think it was last year they started going to crowdsourcing. Right trying to get the general public to help sift through this, this massive amount of data they get in, but now they've got servers doing it for them. Well, yeah, and even, even by crowdsourcing that out, they were never going to have enough people sitting there in front of their computers every day to sift through any of that. I mean, right. such a small percentage. So this is great, and now maybe we'll start finding more anomalies there. And another thing that's great in the search for extraterrestrial life is, as you and I mentioned time and time again on this show, with astrobiologists looking for life as we know it. Now we have a scientist saying, hey guys, look, there's so much out there and we have so little time to, to look at this for glancing over all these planets we're coming mm -hmm. across. These millions and millions of planets we keep finding, potential planets. If we're only looking at the Earth-like ones, we could be missing so much. Yeah, there you go, life as we know it. And it's also the idea of physics as we know it. Yeah. But who's to say that there isn't a broader spectrum out there of life? So I'm glad there are scientists pushing forth this idea. And I, I know that looking for life as we know it is the easy way to go because if we don't know what we're looking for, how are we going to find it? But if we're not even taking the time to look at these other worlds, how do we know? There's too many worlds to look at, though. That's right. <laughs> so it's exciting time. news. Well, let's get into our interview with Seth Shostak. As we already mentioned, Seth is the senior astronomer at the SETI Institute. He spent decades actively participating in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And Seth is also heavily involved in outreach and educational efforts, and he regularly lectures about extraterrestrial life. He also regularly appears on TV shows and participates in radio and television interviews. All right, well, let's get into it. Here's our interview with Dr. Seth Shostak. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Dr. Shostak. We're excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well. You, work, you are the senior astronomer for the SETI Institute, and I think a lot of people, when they hear the SETI Institute, they automatically think of radio telescopes and listening for signals from extraterrestrial intelligence. So for, for those who might not be familiar with the process, um, I wonder if you'd explain to us briefly um, what SETI does with listening to radio signals. Well, indeed, that is our SETI line of research and, of course, is the namesake experiment of this institute, as you've already pointed out, Jason. Uh, actually, the majority of our uh, scientists are not doing SETI, but we'll undoubtedly get back to that at some point. What we're doing is what Jodie Foster did in the movie Contact. Uh, we're, we're trying to find out if there's any life out there or any intelligence. It might not even be biological. That's at least as clever as we are, and we try and do that by eavesdropping on signals they may be sending into space either deliberately or maybe just, you know, leakage in the same way that we, we send signals into space too, even though we're not deliberately trying to do that. So we have these big antennas. Uh, ours are up in uh, Northern California, about 350 miles from where I'm sitting, so 300 miles north of San Francisco in the Cascade Mountains, and it's called the Allen Telescope Array. And we're using that to try and prove that we have some cosmic company. Now, is the Allen Telescope Array the, the only array that SETI uses, or do you guys also use, like, the Arecibo Telescope and, and different telescopes around the world? We have in the past. Until we got our own uh, instrument, uh, in this case, the Allen Array, we would use other people's telescopes. And, you know, there, there's an upside and a downside to that. The upside is you don't have to pay for the maintenance of the telescope, and it can be a very big telescope. Uh, the Arecibo Telescope is the largest antenna in the world, after all. But on the other hand, you're competing with, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of astronomers and other people who are using that instrument for other purposes. So you get very little time. So the question is, do you want a lot of time on a somewhat smaller instrument or do you want a very little amount of time on a very big instrument? Uh, it's more efficient actually to have a lot of time even if the instrument is not quite as big. Now, in the movie Contact, obviously at the end of that, I mean, despite the wow signal, uh, we do have contact. And you've stated previously that you think that we might have contact within the next couple of decades. I'm curious that what uh, led you to that opinion? Yeah, well, it's just based on a very simple uh, calculation, Maureen. Uh, we're looking for a needle in a haystack. So, you know, if somebody says, OK, you guys are going through all this uh, hay here. And when is it that you're actually going to trip across a needle? I mean, the only way you can answer that question is say, well, look, here's how big the haystack is, you know, whatever, and uh, here are how many needles are in there, and here's how quickly we're going through the hay. Now, if you know all three of those numbers, then you're all set to make a prediction. Uh, well, in the case of SETI, we know how big the haystack is. That's just our galaxy. We're, we're looking for company in the Milky Way. 
So we know that. We also know how fast we're going through the hay. And by the way, that increases all the time thanks to improvements in technology. What we don't know is how many needles are in there. Now, there have been, you know, sort of estimates of how many societies out there might be broadcasting, needles, if you will. And uh, on the basis of sort of that range of estimate and the improvement in the speed of the search, I made this prediction that uh, we'll, we'll find ET within the next two, two and a half decades. We'll see if I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you alluded to it, and as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a lot of people view SETI as just searching uh, or listening for, for radio signals, but SETI does a lot of other things contributing to the field of astrobiology. And with the Kepler project, there's so many exciting things going on right now with this uh, discoveries of potential habitable worlds and things like that. So wh how does SETI participate in that? Well, we have a whole slew of scientists, like 30 feet from where I'm sitting here, uh, on the order of 50 or 60 actual, uh, you know, credentialed scientists, PhD scientists, who are worrying about life in space that might not be so intelligent, but might be uh, nearby. Now, you've already mentioned the, the, the fact that we're looking for other planets around other stars. That is the Kepler project uh, principally. And many people who work, from, uh, work on the Kepler project are actually scientists connected with the SETI Institute. But we also have people who are interested in Mars. That's the single largest object of interest around here, Mars, everybody's favorite inhabited planet. Okay, and so, you know, what's the hydrological history of Mars? Where should we look for biology on Mars? Not only Mars, there are, you know, six other places in the solar system, aside from the Earth and Mars, that might have liquids, that might have either water or, in the case of Titan, you know, liquid natural gas pooling on its surface. Well, hey, whenever you have liquids, you get a lot of chemistry, and when you get a lot of chemistry, you might get life. So they're studying all those areas uh, for, uh, you know, indications of how we might look for life there, what it might be like, and so forth, and what we ought to do to, to find it. Now, how did you get involved with SETI? Well, to be honest, uh, I guess I've always been interested in the idea of life in space. I, I think just about, you know, 80% of all kids are interested in aliens, right? I mean, that's, that's a very natural interest. And uh, I, I was interested, too. I saw a lot of bad movies when I was a kid. I, I continue to see bad movies, actually. And uh, in, in fact, I studied radio astronomy in grad school. So I was doing uh, radio astronomical research on galaxies, as it was, but using big radio telescopes, the exact same kind of instrumentation that's used for SETI. And at one point, and, and in fact, I was still a grad student. This was in California, but uh, I was up at three in the morning, you know, using these antennas. And it occurred to me that uh, the instruments I was using to study galaxies could also be used to find out if anybody's out there. And that seemed like a very romantic idea. I didn't do much about it for a very long time, but uh, eventually, and mostly by accident, I ended up here at the SETI Institute. Okay. Well, this is something I've noticed, and I want to get your thought on it. But to me as an outsider, it seems that over the past few years, the opinion of SETI, the SETI Institute and the, and the work you guys do, by the general public, by the mainstream media and by science overall, has greatly improved. You know, that there's been a lot of media coverage of, of SETI efforts over the past few years. And from what I've seen, it's, it's largely been positive. Well, I agree with that, Jason. I think it is positive, but I, where I might disagree a little bit is that there's been a change. I honestly don't, don't see it. Now, mind you, I'm not exactly in an objective position here. <laughs> Obviously, if they don't, if they don't be believe that what we're doing is worthwhile, they may not ever get in touch with me, and I won't see them. So there are selection effects. But my experience in terms of dealing with the media and dealing with the public is that they've always found this very interesting. There is always a, a small percentage, and it is a small percentage, of people who are very skeptical that either there's any intelligence out there. These people like to think they're the smartest things in the galaxy, which might be true. Then again, might not be true. Uh, and, and, you know, or they have other reasons for thinking that, well, this is a waste of time because, you know, this experiment couldn't possibly find them for whatever reason. Uh, but I think they've always been interested. I, the only, in fact, change over the last, I don't know, 20 some years that I've seen in the public's interest in this was when the X-Files was playing on television. <laughs> then there seemed to be a little bit more interest. There's no doubt that finding planets around other stars as we continue to do. That, that I think, has sunk in uh, among the public in a way that uh, encourages them to think, well, hey, if there's so much cosmic real estate, maybe there's something inhabiting it. Well, and on, in that uh, same effect, 
talking about inhabiting other planets. Now, there's been so much uh, in the mainstream media and all these new companies with the goal to colonize space. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I'm all for it myself. Uh, you know, it, it brings up some questions that might not be so very obvious uh, when you first talk about it. I mean, colonization, you know, that's something that we've done forever here on the Earth, right? And, uh, I mean, this, this country is the result of colonization. First 12,000 years ago by people coming in from Asia and more recently by the Europeans. We're all for colonization in general, uh, not necessarily all in favor of colonies. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of it primarily because if you do that, then you spread humans out a little bit. We're on more than one world. And, and at that point, I think it's very hard to self-destruct totally. I think that's so that's a that's a good thing in a, in a sort of a lugubrious way. That's that's a good thing. But there are lots and lots of problems to begin with. It's not easy. Most of the planets people think of our worlds uh, as targets for colonization, the moon, Mars and so forth. These are not really very attractive worlds, even Mars. And, and Mars only doubles the amount of real estate you have. I mean, you might say it doesn't even do that. It's a small, small planet, but it doesn't have any oceans taking up a lot of space. So, you know, the amount of uh, acreage you have there for your, your condo developments is about the same as on the Earth. So, you know, that might be an alternative to building condos in Arizona, for example. But, <laughs> but it only doubles things. It doesn't improve things by a factor of 10 or 100 or 1,000. To do that, you need space colonies. And I think that that's, that's something we'll do. So I'm all in favor of it. But, you know, suppose you went to Mars and you say, yeah, we're going to build a colony here. And then it turns out there's some sort of biota on Mars. You know, there are all these microbes living underneath the surface. And when you go there and, and try and improve things for yourself, you might wipe them all out. Should you do that? I mean, there, you know, there are questions like that. that. That's a very good question. I think that, you know, a lot of people have stated that they feel that with, with humans on Mars, which is the project that Mars One is currently working on, that we'll have a better chance of finding uh, microbial life instead of maybe curiosity doing that. Though that's a really good point, that that may have the opposite effect. Yeah, but you're absolutely right about uh, the, the chances of finding life would undoubtedly improve by having some biologists and geologists actually on the surface because they can, they can get around a lot faster than any of our rovers, and they're very, you know, uh, expert in what to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, curiosity isn't looking for life at all. It's just looking for, you know, chemicals. So, uh, you know, we, we still don't have rovers on the surface of Mars. We haven't since the 1970s that are specifically designed to look for life. Uh, and, and people could do that better. But indeed, uh, you know, suppose you go up there and you find that, you know, t 20 feet under your feet or uh, 100 feet or 1,000 feet under your, un under your toes, there's all this, uh, this whole ecosystem, you know. Uh, what do you owe it? Is it their planet? Is it your planet? You know, who knows? It gets really interesting. But, uh, I'm guessing you haven't signed up to be a Mars One astronaut. Well, yeah, Bas Lonstorp in the, in the Netherlands. Yes, he's, he's looking for volunteers. I have not signed up. I figured they wouldn't want me a, along because they don't like the jokes. But uh, <laughs> on the other hand, you know, and it is a one-way ticket. But you'd be, you know, it was a one-way ticket for the pilgrims, too. So that's his argument. And I, you know, I, I can buy into that. I, I think it's a very interesting idea. The, the, the problem there, I think, is that, you know, how are you going to fund it? And he says he's going to do it via the television rights. I, I don't know whether that'll work or not, but I admire the uh, initiative. I think that's just what we need. Well, let's talk about what happens now when we detect intelligent extraterrestrials. What happens at that point? Are you still part of the post-detection task group? Yeah, well, I am, a, and I was for 10 years, the uh, chairman of the International Academy of Astronautics SETI Permanent Committee, and we were concerned about this. We redrafted some what are called protocols, which is a very heavy word, but in any case, trying to address the question of what indeed does happen. And, and I can tell you what happens because we've had false alarms. We know what really happens. You know, in, in theory, people follow some sort of schema, this, this uh, set of protocols, for example, that says, look, first check out this signal, make sure it's real. Of course you would do that. That's just good science. But the, the next thing it, does, it says is, you know, uh, tell everyone. Tell everyone. I think that the public doesn't realize that there, there's no secrecy. There's no policy of secrecy. And in fact, on the basis of false alarms, we know that in case of a suspected detection, the newspapers start calling up right away because there is no secrecy. But And the third thing in the protocols is don't respond without first getting everybody's buy-in. That was originally put in there during the time of the Cold War, and that was to ensure that no country tried to monopolize the communication channel. I don't think it matters terribly much what we say, honestly, but that, that's me. Uh, but I'll tell you what really happens because we've seen it. And what really happens is that the media go nuts 
if you get a signal that looks like it's the real deal, immediately the newspapers and the uh, TV and radio stations are calling you up. All right. You are a big proponent of outreach, and I really admire a lot of the outreach you do, your efforts to get people, and not only people, but young people, interested not only in extraterrestrials, but science in general. Uh, you speak all around the world at, at interesting events, too, like Comic-Cons and things like that, trying to, to appeal to, to younger audiences. I think that's great. What is your favorite uh, thing to do in terms of outreach. You know, you podcast, you, you blog for the Huffington Post, you lecture. Do you, do you have a favorite means of outreach? Well, <laughs> my favorite might not be my most effective, I have to tell <laughs> you. Uh, I, you know, I, I enjoy the writing because that's creative and you do it by yourself. You don't need a whole team of people. It's one of the few things uh, in, in life these days that you can do without a whole team of people. Uh, maybe composing music is something else and writing the great American novel. You know, those are not done by teams. Right. Almost everything else is done by teams. But uh, so I personally, in terms of uh, personal gratification, if I've written something that amuses me when I read it back, then I like that. But in terms of events, I do like meeting people. I like people. So I enjoy going to uh, I just went to a steampunk convention here <laughs> in the Bay Area. And that was great because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Victorian technology and everybody was dressed up like the Victorians. I gave a talk about SETI. I don't know. You know, it was an inoffensive talk. But were but, you dressed up? I, no, I well, uh, <laughs> kind of the way you see me now. But uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't dressed up. But I, I certainly enjoyed that. I think that of the various conventions and so forth that I routinely go to, my favorite, I guess, would be the Conference on World Affairs in Boulder, Colorado, mm -hmm. every April. Uh, they put me on, you know, eight or eight or nine panels, and you know, some of them have to do with science, and those, of course, are fun. But they also put me on panels that have nothing to do with science. Um, you know, contemporary music or sex with turtles or whatever. I mean, you know, <laughs> just something completely different. And to be, <laughs> to be completely candid, those are often much more fun for me than the science ones because I can be completely off the wall if, if you don't think I'm off the wall already. <laughs> <laughs> so now where can people go and find where you're going to be talking? Well, you know, it's not as easy as one would think. It should be easy. I try and keep the SETI Institute's website up to date about that. And uh, I'm glad you reminded me, Maureen. I should send them an update. But <laughs> indeed, if they just go to SETI.org on their browser, uh, there's somewhere in there there's the calendar, and that's where you should be able to find me. And would you clarify, I, I, I've been uh, looking into your, your, your podcast. I know you used to do Are We Alone, and did that transform into big picture science, or is it something different altogether? No, it's not. It's the, uh, it's the show that used to be called Are We Alone? And what we found, uh, we were trying to get carriage on uh, stations, radio stations, not just podcasts. Uh, we're on something like 85 stations now. And, but what we found a couple of years ago is when we talked to program managers at, at stations that they found Are We Alone? They wouldn't even listen to it because they thought it was a niche product, that it was only about SETI which even at the time wasn't true. I mean, you know, SETI is a subject that you can go through very quickly on a radio show. After, you know, a couple of episodes, you're, you're kind of through the, the most current material. So we do a very wide range of science, and we, we figured that we had to change the title just to make sure that the show wasn't being overlooked by people who were interested in science, but not necessarily in SETI. Well, on TV, the Science Channel certainly has attached itself to Are We Alone, repeating their uh, monthly Are We Alone series in the month, yeah. of, month of March. They've done that two years now, I think. Yes, yes. Well, the public's interested. I mean, a lot of the public interest has to do with, of course, UFOs and things like that. And every day I hear from members of the public who have something to tell me about their personal experiences with the alien craft or alien beings. Uh, one third of the population believes that we're being visited. So that's, that's a big interest. And obviously that makes for a very dramatic kind of TV show, whereas sitting around next to a big antenna might not be quite so dramatic. So a lot of the Are We Alone is, is uh, aimed toward the UFO folk. But, uh, you know, hey, look, they're interested in the idea of life in space. That's great. Well, Seth, thank you so much for your time. This has been a lot of fun. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Jason, thank Maureen, thank you very much for having me. You bet. All right, take care. Thanks. Again, SETI.org is where you can go to find out more about Seth and about the latest news from the SETI Institute. It's also where you can go to listen to SETI's weekly radio show, Big Picture Science. And that's it for this episode of Spacing Out. Be sure to visit us at openminds.tv for all the latest news. And if you're a podcast listener, go to openminds.tv slash radio and check out Open Minds UFO Radio. We love hearing what you have to say, so leave your comments below and click on the like button if you enjoy today's show. 
And remember to subscribe to the Open Minds YouTube channel. We're constantly uploading interesting video content in addition to this show, like all the exclusive interviews we uploaded last week from the Citizen Hearing. So if you haven't seen those, check them out. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm Maureen Elsberry. And I'm Jason McClellan, and we will see you in the future.